in Georgia. We make our home now in Cleveland, Tennessee, in the southeastern part of the United States. I'm sure you can tell readily that I'm not originally from Vancouver, Canada. <laughs> the Lord has been gracious to us. We have been in Canada all through the years with our ministry, and have just finished up a meeting over in Florida at the People's Baptist Church, and we are grateful for the privilege, as I said, to be here tonight. We have been missionaries with the Rock of Ages for the past 27 years. Our ministry primarily rotates and revolves around prison outreach. We began as a tape ministry to foreign missionaries by our founder, uh, Dr. Ed Blue, and uh, through that, the Lord opened up an opportunity to be able to preach in the prisons in the state of Florida, and uh, through a series of events that took place and a local pastor by the name of Ron Garris, I came aboard to serve as the first missionary with the Rock of Ages, and uh, today we have 140 missionary families working with the Rock of Ages and throughout the United States on five different continents and the 16 different countries where the Lord has opened the doors to our ministry. We primarily, as I said, work in the prisons. We are basically a mission organization and outreach to governmental establishments. The city, county jails, and the state and federal prisons, along with the juvenile facilities, uh, the Lord has opened the doors to our ministry in many nations around the world as our uh, ministry has taken the gospel into the institutions. And uh, the United States of America has the largest prison population in any nation on planet Earth. Uh, China, of course, has been the largest uh, populated nation of the world. And uh, they have just, if I remember correctly, a little under 1 million that are in prison. The United States around 392 million residents. And we have right at 3 million that are actually locked behind prison bars. Over 10 million worldwide, we have almost one-third of the world's prison population. When you begin to add in the ones that are on bond, uh, those that are on parole and um, out of prison on good behavior and things of that nature, all encompassing, it's right at approaching 10 million worldwide and about 7 million in the United States of America, when you include all of the uh, facets of corrections. What a tremendous mission field an open opportunity that God has given to us to reach out into the prisons. We have our own printing ministry, and we print over 25 to 26 million pieces of material on an annual basis. This would include Discipleship Institute literature along with Bible tracts and uh, other materials we offer to the inmates. Uh, the charge to the inmate is free of charge to them their families. We do not charge them a single penny. Our postage out of our main office in Cleveland, Tennessee averages about $1,800 $2,000 on a weekly basis. And that's only for about 13,000 students that are based in the United States. The balance of those students are in different nations around the world. My wife and I serve as a missionary. We receive no remuneration or funding from the Rock of Ages. In fact, we have not only the distinct privilege of raising our own support, but we also have the privilege of raising the support for our ministry. With our printing ministry, as I stated, uh, the materials we print in excess of 20 five to 26 million a year. We're trying to increase that to 45 to 50 million pieces of material a year. In order to accommodate that, we have had to update some of our printing presses. And I'll just briefly take a moment tonight to share with you what the Lord has done. And we were in our national conference trying to raise funds to print a, or to purchase a Heidelberg color press, five to six color press. It's a massive press, does outstanding work. But as we were in the conference trying to raise the funds, uh, unbeknown to us, the gentleman that had the printing press sold it out from others and uh, sold it to another company. And uh, but the Lord has a way of working those things out. We were able to purchase a 2007 digital press. It saves all of the press work. It goes directly from our computer to the printing press. It does outstanding work. In fact, National Geographic's used this particular press for quite some time uh, to produce some of their magazines and material that give you an idea of the quality of print that it is capable of producing. And uh, this press would cost anywhere from three quarter to a million dollars new. And um, the Lord gave it to us, 2007 model, only has about 13 million impressions on it, which if you know anything about printing equipment, it's really just getting broke in. And uh, they gave us from a bumper to bumper, unlimited warranty, one year free tech support, and one year of uh, supplies to print on the press. All we have to do is provide the paper, the Lord provided for $125,000. Yeah. So, uh, it's a miracle what the Lord has done. We just recently in the state of Florida, Church Road, a check for $16,000 and paid off the press. The balance of it, we're grateful for what the Lord has done. Now, the spray, we're trying to purchase a truckload of paper, which we can get. The filling economy has its blessings. 
a truckload of paper that normally would cost us, when I say a truckload, a tractor trailer load of paper would uh, normally cost anywhere from 18 to 21,000. And we should be able to get it for around 14,000 out because of the economy. And so the Lord's been gracious. We already have about 6,200 toward that. And we would appreciate it if you'd help us pray concerning that matter. Uh, the Lord, last year, people often ask us if um, we have anyone saved from gospel tracts and materials that we distribute in the institutions. Well, I'm glad to report to you that we know for a fact that 167 souls were saved from the gospel tract distribution last year because we had 167 uh, people that wrote to our ministry and said they got saved by giving the life I gave the life to the Lord by reading the gospel tracts. Uh, let me, if I may, just share this with you tonight. Uh, one of the prisons went into many years ago. Our ministry was really just getting started over 35 years ago, or right at 35 years ago. And there was one particular prison that had death row housing uh, units and uh, several men that were on death row. This particular prison would not allow us back into the death row housing units. Today we can go practically in any uh, area of the institutions where our ministry is established. Back then it was off limits to go into the death row of this particular prison. But God has a way of getting the gospel where he intends for it to go. As so our men were passing out gospel tracts on the prison yard, all of a sudden the wind picked up and began to blow. And uh, David said in the song that the Lord takes the wind out of his treasuries every morning. And that God allowed the wind to blow and blow a little gospel tract through the rotund area of the prison and the institution. And as the officers moved back and forth from the death row housing unit, each time the door was open, the gust of wind would push out a little gospel tract deeper into the institution until it would find its way underneath a death row inmate's cell door, and he would reach up with his fingers and fish it underneath the door, open it up and read it, and give his life to the Lord, and write to our ministry and tell us how that God had a way of getting the gospel back into the death row housing units when we were not able to get there. The Lord has a way of doing that. But we are grateful for all that God's done. And the Lord has also allowed us last year through our revival ministry to conduct over 1,600, 1,600 prison revivals around the world. And last year, through the 140 missionaries collectively of all the volunteers and churches around the world that work with our ministry, we were able to reach an average a soul for Christ on every 9.7 minute average, 24 hours a day, 360 days, uh, 65 days out of the year. And God's been very gracious to us at the Rock of Ages. In fact, last year was the greatest year in the history of the 35 years' existence of this ministry. Along with the prisons, God has also opened the doors be able to go into the public schools, not only in the United States, but in many nations around the world. Uh, for example, in the Philippines, we have several institutions, schools that are established with upwards of 20 to 25,000 students. Our missionaries are able to go from sunup to sundown with various classes that are rotated throughout the day and literally take a Bible and preach the gospel. And the Lord has opened many, many doors. Last year in the United States alone, we had contact with over 26,000 students in the public schools, over 360 that trusted Christ as a personal Amen. Savior. God has done a wonderful work. In fact, let me, if I may, share with you just a moment what the Lord did in 2012 through the ministry and our missionaries. We're established in Cleveland, Tennessee. The county that our ministry is located in is called Bradley County. Our adjacent county is Polk County. And Polk County, five years ago, contacted the Rock of Ages and asked if we would take our public school curriculum that we take into the public schools, private and alternate schools, and share it in the juvenile courtroom and also the public schools and within that county. Unbeknown to us, they were keeping records as to the impact that our character under construction curriculum was having in the classroom and also in the juvenile courts. Our missionaries, working with Judge Belial and one of the probation officers by the name of Mr. Motes, they offered the juveniles alternate sentencing. They could either serve their time and their sentence in a juvenile prison, or they could spend 15 hours, a total of one hour a week, in the courtroom, mandatory that one of their parents had to attend, underneath the teaching of the Rock of Ages missionary. We would take our Bible, we would take our character concepts, and for one hour a week, for 15 weeks, we'd go into the courtroom with a juvenile and their parents, and teach the Bible, the Word of God. Well, most of the juveniles selected to take the 15 hours with their parents rather than spending their months or years in the juvenile prison. 
recently we had a pastor's banquet in our region, and I asked Judge Belial and Mr. Moses to come and to give a testimony as to what the Lord has allowed the ministry to accomplish within that county. I didn't realize the full impact until that night when he gave this testimony. So within the past five years, they have collected data on the juvenile crime within Polk County. He stated that the juvenile crime had decreased by 98% in the five years our ministry has been established in the pork rooms. Well, that's what happens when we put the Bible back in our homes, Amen. back in our nations, and back in our uh, institutions that have been established within our nation. Amen. Also, they said in 2012, for the first time in the history of the county since they've been keeping records, it was the first year that the county did not send one single juvenile to state custody we're grateful for the testimony of the Word of God. Please help us pray that the Lord will continue to open many doors of opportunity where our public school is concerned. Amen. And also, we have a ministry where we're reaching out to the juvenile facilities uh, along with the public schools, and God has opened up an entire juvenile department. And we've been able to see several dozen of our missionaries that target the juvenile facilities, and God's working a wonderful work and revival in those institutions. We also target the military facilities. Basically, the Briggs and uh, those at the Regional Correction Facility, we have a full-time chaplain that serves in the state of Washington down in the Tacoma area at the Fort Lewis Army Base, and he has an unprecedented past to be able to get on the base as a civilian, and because the institution is based uh, within the uh, compound, uh, compound of uh, Fort Lewis, we have had the opportunity to be able to go on the base and preach in the chapels for the military soldiers, that are getting ready to go out, for example, in the peak of the deployment for the Iraq and Afghanistan war, we were able to go ahead and preach and conduct revival services, and the Lord gave us much fruit, and we're grateful for the souls that have been saved and the lives that have been changed as a result of that. We also have, we have so many ministries tonight, I can keep your all night just sharing with you what the Lord's done. We have a Rock of Ages study Bible. We prepared this several years ago. We bought the old Pilgrim study Bible from Oxford, and we extracted the notes put our notes into the uh, place of the old notes, the study notes, so that you have doctrine that you can trust. Several of the pastors in our fundamental churches got hold of the Bible and uh, stated that they wanted those in the pews because there was not a good, solid, independent fundamental Baptist study Bible that was available, and we have those available as well to the churches and God's people around the world. Today we've been able to distribute, we're working on 65,000 Bible uh, Bibles that have been distributed in the institutions would ask you to continue to pray that the Lord will supply uh, the Bibles needed to be able to distribute them. If we had three million, we could get those distributed in the institutions uh, in the United States and also around the world uh, to the many inmates that are needed. So please, if you would, join with us in prayer of uh, what that need is concerned. Well, let me say this very quickly tonight, and I'll get into the message. But if you would pray for my wife, she has a ministry. It's called the Lovely Ladies Ministry. And it basically, we're reaching out to the inmates, sisters, mothers, daughters, fiancés, girlfriends, and so forth. And God has blessed that in a wonderful, wonderful way. We've been able to see a great number of people saved each year at Christmas. We have various churches that will get together, and the ladies will sew uh, full-size Christmas stockings. And we will take those and we'll stuff them with soap, shampoo, uh, personal hygiene items. And, of course, we put the most important thing in them, and that's gospel tracts and New Testaments. We take them into the institutions and distribute them, and it's been a huge success. We've been able to see uh, several hundred of the last few years saved and trust Christ as a personal Savior, and we would ask you to please continue to pray for that if you would. Pray for our children. They are missionaries uh, in the Philippines, our daughter and son-in-law, and also our three grandchildren in the island of Cebu, and doing a wonderful work. I want to spend a lot of time there tonight. We're actually back in the States now on furlough and raising more support, so please continue to pray for them. Then pray for our son Randy. And if I may give you a prayer request, add uh, to your request tonight. I didn't want to take your time up while you were taking the prayer request for the church folk that are here tonight and your guests. But my dad is in the hospital. Uh, he has had a collapsed lung. In fact, he's had four collapsed lungs for, for the last about five weeks. And it's not doing well. And uh, then my mother had uh, bad test results that come back. She's waiting on a biopsy report. And both of those we found out just as we were in Atlanta, Georgia, getting ready to board the plane to fly to Seattle to come up to um, Canada here. And if you would pray for both of them, his name is Ralph. 
My mother's name is Shirley, and of course her last name is Ellis. Ralph and Shirley Ellis, and if you would pray for them, we'd be ever so grateful if you'd add them to your prayer list and pray as often as the Lord reminds you of them. Tonight, again, the Lord has opened many effectual doors to the ministry. We do ask you to please help us pray. We have 140 missionaries with our ministry. Amen. We would be able to place upwards of three to 400 almost immediately if we had those for support and ready to do the work. So I hope I'm not talking too fast for you. I'm really talking slow for me tonight. So uh, every time I come to Canada, they're saying, slow down a little bit, Brother Ellis, so we can keep up with you. But uh, please do join with us in prayer in these needs if you would. To have your Bible tonight, please start with the book of First Kings, if you would, please, and First Kings. We'll take just a moment and uh, share with you some scripture out of this passage of the Bible. And we are, again, grateful for all that the Lord has done. It's exciting to see what the Lord's doing here and uh, through this church and for the folks that are here this evening and uh, to know that God is building a faithful work, a strong work here at Anchor Baptist Church. I do appreciate your pastor, Pastor Turner. We just had the opportunity to visit this evening and to fellowship some, and we appreciate him for his position and for the ministry that God is obviously allowed to establish here. I do hope and pray that you will seek the Lord and what God would have for you. I know that there'd be no greater joy for Pastor Turner than to know that God has sent forth pastors, evangelists, and missionaries, and full-time Christian workers who cried out of this church here at Anchor Baptist Amen. Church. And so we pray that God's will be done in your life and that you'll seek the Lord with a whole heart. Amen. Well, with that being said, if you turn with me to 1 Kings again, and we'll go to 1 Kings 17. And if you have your Bible there, let's stand in reverence to the reading of the Scriptures tonight. In 1 Kings chapter 17, I'll begin reading down in verse 8. Very familiar passage of Scripture. For the word, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her, and said, Fetch, I, uh, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel, that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her, and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise, and behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and have to make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Our fathers, we bow before you this evening, Lord. I thank you for this church and for thy people. I ask you now that you'll bless the reading and the preaching of thy word. I would ask you that you'll give the anointing, the presence, the divine power of the Holy Spirit of God, and may be able to preach in the power and demonstration of the scriptures of the Spirit of God. Please, I'd ask you tonight that you may be with those that sit under the side of our boss, there's one here that is lost, and those not Christ. Please, I pray, to Lord, that you make them victim of their sin, show them their great need of the Savior, help them to act upon that need, even this very moment, that they might be saved, born into the family of God. Lord, if there are those sitting under the sound of our voice who are discouraged, despondent, their hearts were once aflame in the fire for the glory of God. Now their heart is cold and distant. Lord, each day they lose their desire to serve you, to pray, to read the Bible, and to be all that they could be and should be for the glory of God. 
May the Spirit of God use thy word to rest their souls. Lord, that they might find themselves tonight bound before the throne of grace, rededicating their heart to the Lord. Encourage your people tonight that you meet with us. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen and amen. amen. May you see you. In this passage of Scripture tonight, we have a very interesting story in the Old Testament written in 1 Kings in chapter 17. In this passage of Scripture, we have a great miracle that is recorded, and it is a miracle that I believe that you and I can learn from tonight. There are several biblical truths, and I'd like to direct our attention tonight to this passage of Scripture in this verse found in verse 11. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a little morsel of bread in thine hand. And notice verse 12. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Notice that as Elijah approaches this here lady, that he asked her for a king. And she says to him, Thy servant hath not a handful and a little oil in the cross. I want to speak to you for just a few moments tonight. And this will be the only passage that we'll look at. But I want to speak to you on this thought. Little is much when you're God. Amen. Little is much when God is in it. You may not have very much tonight, but I want you to know you don't have to have much. If you'll give what you have to God, He'll bless it and He'll multiply it right. according to His grace. Now notice with me just a few things, simple truths in this passage of Scripture. There are several examples in the Bible tonight. As I said, we'll look strictly at this one. But notice, if you would, that God speaks to Elijah in verse 9, and he begins by saying, Arise and get thee to Zarephath. And then the Bible said, Which belongeth to Zidon. And then notice, if you would, please, in verse 10. And so he arose and went. Notice the command of God came in verse 9, and immediately the man of God is about the Father's business. Can I ask you tonight, you're about the Father's business? Are you being obedient to what God has asked you to do? You're obviously obedient to church. You wouldn't be here tonight on a midweek prayer service of all nights. It's when most folk use an uh, excuse of work and different things, and not just work, but uh, just small things that would restrict them or keep them from coming to church. Well, that's not you tonight. You're here. But we must be obedient want God to bless our lives with what we have. And so the Bible said that he arose and he went, and I'm going to get straight to where I'm trying to get to tonight, but I'm going to look at a couple of things first. And notice in the latter part of verse 10 there in the middle section, it says, and he came to the gate of the city, and behold, now notice this, the widow woman, not just any widow woman, but the one that God had already told Elijah that he had ordained that she would take care of him. Can you imagine the man of God having to go to a widow woman and God ordered the widow woman to take care of the man of God? I wonder how that make you feel. Have to live off of a widow woman. But Elijah didn't have a problem with it. Not because he took advantage of widows. But Elijah didn't have a problem with it because he knew that God had ordered it. And Elijah knows that if God's in it, it's going to be all right. And Elijah knew that God must have a miracle in store for this woman. And so he goes and he is obedient to the Lord. And he finds the woman, not just a woman, the woman that God had ordained for him to meet. Now follow with me. I'm not in the text yet. I'm trying to get there so I can preach quick now. Look with me. She was gathering sticks. And notice what he said. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, 
Notice, if you would, that Elijah's testing her obedience. He says to him, to fetch me some water. While she's going to fetch the water, he gives her another request. He called unto her and said, Bring me, I bring thee a little morsel of bread in thine hand. Now I'm going to take just a moment now in verse 12 and look at some truths we find here. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth. Did you catch that? As the Lord thy God liveth. This lady knew who the man of God was. And she knew his God. Well, there's a lot of people here in your area that needs to know your God. And we have a clear cut command to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And she says, As the Lord thy God liveth. Now, watch this. I have not a cake but a handful of meal in a barrel. Now when we first read that, we have we are prone to think that a handful is like this. That somehow she has enough meal in her barrel to fill both hands if they were cut. Some tonight may think that a handful is everything you could get in a clenched fist as you would scrape the bottom of the barrel with your hand. But that's not what that verse means. When the Bible refers to the handful, it is referring to the hollow of the hand. If you hold your hand out like that, there's a little indentation, a little cut in the palm of your hand. And that is the amount of flour that she says to Elijah, the man of God, that's all I have is for the handful. Just the cup in the palm of my hand, my chair. What's the man of God going to do? She's gathering two sticks that she may go in and cook the last meal, a cake for her and a cake for her son, and she very clearly says that they might die. Notice that she is at the end of her resources. She's at the end of her life. She's facing death. She's set things in order. She knows it's not going to be long. And she's setting her house in order. I notice, if you would, of all the audacity, notice what the man of God's going to do. She said, I have but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. Then she said that she's going to gather two sticks and she may go in and dress it for her and her son that they may eat it and die. But notice Elijah's Request in verse 13. It's a most unusual request after what the lady has just told him. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not. You in distress tonight? Your family in shambles and on the brink of ruin? Have a wayward son or daughter? Other than dad you've been praying for? Just lost your job? You're overwhelmed with finances? Elijah says to the widow woman who is at the end of her life and the end of her resources, fear not. Amen. Amen. Do you remember in the New Testament when the disciples were in the midst of the sea and the storm was tossing to and fro and they were fear for their life? And all he did is he'd come out, he was asleep in the bow of the ship and he'd come out and he said, peace, be still. And just like that, the water's gone. And so much that they said, what manner of man is this that even the winds obeyed his voice? And with two words, God's going to settle all of her fears and all of her anxieties. In the New Testament, when the Bible says, take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought of itself. And the word thought in that passage of Scripture, it means fear, anxiety. And in the context of its Scripture, if you go back and read, he's talking about the lilies of the field. And Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like unto one of them. He talks about the sparrows. They neither plant nor sow, but yet your heavenly Father takes care of them, does He not? 
And notice what he says. He says, How much the more shall your heavenly Father give you these things? Do you know what happens in that text of Scripture when we fear and we doubt God and we work ourselves up with anxiety like this widow woman here in 1 Kings 17? What God is teaching is this, that we abase ourselves below the animal kingdom. He takes care of the fowls. He takes care of the lilies of the valley and the field. The sparrow, there's not a sparrow that falls to the ground that he doesn't know about. He knows the very hairs on our head. The ones of us that have some left. Mine's going fast. One old preacher down where I'm from in Georgia said, God made a lot of heads that he covered up, and then some of them he has a crowd up and he left them uncovered. Yeah. <laughs> Mine started out bad, but it's getting better as I go. <laughs> Anxiety. And when we fear and fret and we don't trust God with our needs and with our family and our situation and circumstances, we're putting ourselves below the animal kingdom. Don't get in the New Testament. I'm still in 1 Kings 17. Notice. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Now watch what he says. Go and do as thou hast said. Now watch this. This is an unusual request for a man of God to make to a widow woman that's getting ready to eat her last meal and die. Notice what he says. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and thy son. Now at first... This looks like a terrible thing for the man of God to do. The poor lady's just told him, Elijah, I've just got enough for two little cakes, and I'm going to feed my son, and I, we're going to eat, we're going to be dead. We're gone. And so he says to her, well, go make me one first. That sounds like he's stingy. It's kind of like the preacher I heard once say one years ago, at one time he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive, so you give and I'll receive. Well, that's not what God has in mind, okay? I might be from Georgia, and I'm kind of like the guy that, you know, um, joined the Navy, and they told him, said, sailor, get on board. So I'm going to ship him out, and he said, I'm not getting on board. Uh -huh, you're not getting me on that boat. He said, you better get on board, sailor. We're going to court-martial you. He said, I might be from Georgia, and I might be dumb. But I'm not stupid enough to get on a boat that sinks on purpose. It's trying to get him on a submarine. <laughs> and Elijah says to her, go make me a cake first. What a request. But wait a minute. At first it looks like he is selfish. But did you catch what he said? But make me thereof, in verse 13, a little cake first and bring it unto me. Now watch this. And after, make for thee and thy son. Elijah knew God was going to work a miracle. He knew that if this lady be willing to give God what she had, God was going to stretch her resources. Amen. And so he says, you make me first. Then go beg for thee and thy son. She just told him she didn't have enough for her and her son. You see, there is a Bible principle that we see in the scriptures. We find it in Luke 6 38. Give and shall be given unto you. And pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. You say, Well, when God gives me a lot of money, I'll give it to him. No, God says, I'm waiting on you first. Remind me of the pastor that preached his message and was standing at the back door shaking hands with folks and a little girl came up, she was just a few years old, and said to a preacher, when I get old, I'm going to make a lot of money and I'm going to give you some of it. He said, well, that's the sweetest thing I've ever heard in my life. What would you want to do that for? She said, well, I'm always hearing my daddy say, you're the poorest preacher he's ever heard in his life. 
Can I tell all you what it? <laughs> Give and it shall be given unto you. You say, well, if God would just, no, God says, you give, then I'll give. Widow lady, you, you want enough for you and your son? Then give to God. God will take care of the rest. Good. I'm not talking about just finances. Yes, I'm a missionary tonight. I understand that. And I'm not preaching just a missions message tonight. You say, I don't have much talent. Why don't you give him what you have Amen. and watch him bless it? Amen. Right. So I don't have a lot of time. Then why don't you go out soul winning with your preacher, knocking on doors, inviting folk, passing out gospel tracts? While some of us do so little, you don't mind if I preach like I preach in prison, do you? Some of us do so little, our guardian angels are having to file for unemployment. <laughs> Anybody can pass out a gospel track. Even our grandchildren, five, seven, and eight years old, will pass out a gospel track. When they first went to the Philippines, they were standing in the window looking out of their hotel, looking down, and their little Dixie, who was, uh, was she five or six at, the time, six at the time, I believe, she said to her daddy, Up, up, get out of bed. Let's go pass out tracks. Get all the tracks out. She thought if they got rid of all the tracks, they could come home to Nan and Papa's in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> but even a six year old can pass out a gospel track. I feel like preaching now. I've been a long drive over here from Kelowna. I know it's only five hours, but it felt like 50 to me. I'm awake, ready to go now. Look at this passage of Scripture. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel in verse 14, the barrel of meal shall not waste. And the word waste means cease or end. Neither shall the cruise of oil fail. And that means to lack or to lessen. Until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went Notice her obedience to the Lord. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat, now watch this, many days. My wife and I went with the Rock of Ages Ministries 27 years ago. We went full time with $127 a month support. I know it's not God's will for everyone to do that, but I know without a shadow of a doubt it's the Lord's will for us to go. And I've put on a good bit of weight since I've become a missionary. In fact, I've put on a lot of weight just since I crossed the Canadian border. <laughs> you can beat to the death of it. When I first flew in to Seattle, my coat fit. Now it's tight. <laughs> That's just in a week. I want you to notice something here in verse 16. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail. Watch this. According to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. Did you catch that? Which the Lord spake by Elijah. You know why it turned out this way? Because of this. It was his command. Elijah was the mouthpiece of God. He was his prophet. I don't know where they come up with it, but theologians say it says that they did eat many days. If that means that they ate for one solid year off of that meal and that meal cruise of oil. I don't know where they come up with a year at. It's not in my King James Bible. But I do know this. Many days. Many days. I preached up in the state of Michigan. And, um, oh, where's Brother Spencer at? This is Hollis. Yeah, Holland, Michigan. I might have been for a moment. Brother Spencer's been a dear friend of ours for several years. And I preached for him a missions conference. It's been a few years back. 
And a lady came to me after this, one of the services and said to me, said, Brother Ellis, I'm going to share with you something that most folks would think that I was crazy and I dare not share with you. But she said, back in the summer, in the heat of the summer, our, my husband left us. Left us with a power bill, left us with a rent, left us with a car bill. He left us with everything. He said, she said, you know, she said, I can't afford to keep the power on. I can't afford a lot of the luxuries that we had. I had to let them go. So we have the house. If I remember right, she said she took, used the public transit system to get to work in back. She said, preacher, God's my witness. I had to have her power turned off. She said, in the middle of the summer, I buy milk for the kids, poultry, fish, bread. She said, I didn't have any refrigeration to keep it in. So we would lay it in the center of our table and we would pray over and say, now God, you did it for the widow lady. Could you do it for me? And she said, preacher, my fish, poultry, bread, and my milk lasted until we had consumed. Amen. He's still God. Yes. Amen. And he's still. Yes. Amen. Amen. What is it the Lord would want of you tonight and ask of you? What are you all worked up in your life for? Can I tell you something from the Lord tonight? Fear not. Amen. Fear not. Let's pray. Our fathers, we bow before you this evening, Lord. We are grateful for the opportunity and privilege we have to be here with the good.